Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for the tremendous gift of this time, for the wonderful blessing of your word, for your spirit within us. Lord, we do pray that as we come to this study, that we would see Jesus. Your plan spread out from Genesis to Revelation. Your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It is spiritual food to us that nourishes us. And chiefly because it points us to your son, Jesus Christ. May that be the case this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> anyone who's been in school, especially if you had a good teacher or a good academic program or sometime, something like that, you notice that the final is not at the beginning of the class. And in fact, while there's uh, you know, certainly lectures and, and homework assignments and other things that are preparing you to fully absorb, there are kind of mini tests or quizzes or you know, section tests all along the way so that when you finally get to that big final test, you're ready to endure it. Classes are designed this way to teach us, uh, teach us most effectively. And what we're going to see is that that is how Joseph and even the Lord seems to be working here with uh, Joseph's brothers. It doesn't just all start off with the biggest test. It starts off with very small, uh, simple tests of their fidelity and their growth. And it leads to this study of chapter 44, chapters 44 and 45, wherein God, uh, God and, and uh, working through Joseph here is going to finally test uh, them and give them every opportunity to fall back into the ways in which they were treating Joseph, their petty uh, jealousy and hatred one for the other. He's going to set that up perfectly, and there's great news that is very frequently overlooked in the world, and that is that people can change. People can grow. We're going to see that people can develop, but only uh, as they walk with the Lord. So that is very good news. So that with that, we're getting into this final test. Our reading uh, began our, our picture of that, but we'll remember that Joseph had uh, spotted his brothers some years before at this point coming to buy grain because of the famine that was affecting them. So they came to buy grain from Egypt because God had uh, supernaturally warned Egypt and used Joseph to administrate that uh, preparation for the seven years of coming famine. Joseph recognized his brothers and knew it was them, but because he was dressed in Egyptian garb, now spoke Egyptian flawlessly, they viewed him as being just another Egyptian official and would not recognize him. And so he used that, he took advantage of that to question them and get the information about his, their relationship or their relationship to their father and the brother that wasn't there. And they thought, these are odd and pointed questions. Wonder why he's asking that. And uh, we ultimately found that his test was to bring them into situations wherein they would have the opportunity to betray their brothers for their own best interest. And so his first uh, ta or movement was to collect Simeon and imprison him. And uh, that test didn't actually go that great. They seemed to be just happy to leave Simeon there. Uh, both Jacob and the, the other brothers seemed to be happy enough to leave Simeon there in prison until such a time as the whole communities. Um, situation became so desperate that Jacob was willing to send everybody back, including Benjamin, the one son of Rachel, the wife that he loved most and had lost, uh, had lost earlier. So this sets up part one of the final test, which is what we looked at last week. Part one of the final test had to do with lining up the brothers all by birth age. And they thought that this was quite mysterious, that he could know what their birth order was as they were all fully grown adults. But he lined them up by birth order, clearly stating that he knew that J uh, Benjamin was the youngest and then honored him with five times the amount of food. And we thought, well, this is, this is interesting. How will they react now? When their other brother, Joseph, was blessed above them, they could only be jealous, not happy for him. They could only hate him and not celebrate his successes and his calling in, 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 in this life and in the covenant community. And so that caused them to sell him into slavery, barely, barely refraining from murdering him. 
So what would happen this time? And what we saw is that they got merry. They were merry and they uh, enjoyed and celebrated the extra blessing of Benjamin. Instead of experiencing jealousy and frustration, anger and hatred for them, they had grown to the point where if Benjamin was given five times the uh, provision and they only, had, you know, whatever the expected provision was, that they could celebrate with him and enjoy the fact that he'd been blessed. And what we saw was that tragic power of jealousy and how it robs you of all the joy and pleasure you can have in your life was removed. Isn't that neat? They, they finally learned over the course of their lives, over the course of those years, and undoubtedly in part from the incredible, painful reality of having to look in the mirror, metaphorically speaking, every morning and know that they had mur or killed or sold their own flesh and blood into slavery because of their own petty jealousy and self-interest. So what we see is that the bad things that they had done actually did the positive work in their life. And they'd seem to have, um, have, have learned the lesson. But this is just part one. You see, I mean, at this point, they could just be smiling and playing along. They could just be pretending to make merry with him and kind of just be glad that they're not all, you know, being made slaves or being uh, taken advantage of by Joseph or from their perspective, this uh, Egyptian official. It could be a ruse. So Joseph continues this test one step further by sending them on their way again, as before. He sends them on their way, giving them full stores of grain and returning their money, uh, money to them. So this is their pattern. In other words, he's providing for them through that, that it's not going to cost them any wealth. But he does something unique in planting this silver cup. This is the final trap. This is the final test to see if they have changed. And so this silver cup of some value, of some note, that would certainly be recognized as not belonging to the Israelites and belonging to him. That's part of the reason, probably, that it's a cup for divination. Because as the Israelites would not uh, have practiced divination historically, um, that they would say, well, that's certainly not my cup. Just like if someone found a Ouija board in your closet, hopefully you would claim that, like, ah, I don't know who put that garbage there. That was not mine. Oh, goodness. Um, so here is this planting the cup was very strategically put, and of course strategically placed in Benjamin's, uh, in the mouth of Benjamin's sack so that they could basically knock this grain sack and, and uh, it would come out. And when he comes, when the steward follows this command of Jacob to chase them down and then call them to account for this, we see that the brothers are very certain that they are not uh, guilty. And the reason why they're certain is that they're not guilty. Like, they, they really didn't do it. They really didn't do anything. However, interestingly, they don't take into account the fact that, that there could be some unknown situation. And so they respond in what I'd call a fairly rash manner. Taking up from verse 6, it says, So he overtook him, he, the steward, overtook them, the children of Israel, and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Be, far be it from us that your servant should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouths of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be, put, uh, be my Lord's slaves. So, I would argue that this is rash. First of all, he's, he, they do something reasonable. They say, look, we're not here to steal from you. Of course we're not going to We brought back the money that was returned to our sacks just in case there was some sort of weird accident because we're honest and we want to pay you for whatever it is that we buy or we, we receive. So we're not of that character. You haven't known us to be of that character. He's also implying that these same, uh, that their, their second return or their return here was actually uh, characterized by the honesty of saying, we brought our younger brother along. His name's Benjamin. You got to see in Quezazel. You know that we're, we're straight guys. We're really honest people. And then it gets a little bit too far, goes a little bit too far. He says, and so if anyone, if you find that on anybody, that one dies and everybody else will be your slave. It's just an extreme statement. He overstates it because his honor's affronted. He knows that he's on. They know that they're honest. 
They know that it's not true, but that they overreact. Or as Ecclesiastes 5, 2, Thus do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. When we get excited to make bombastic and over, uh, you know, overstated words and phrases, we tend to get in trouble. Even if we're very, very sure there is no need to be overstating things for dramatic effect. There's no need to overstate things and make these dramatic, uh, you know, far-reaching uh, results that you really can't handle. Or writing checks, emotionally or spiritually, that you can't cash. So, hopefully there's a little tiny mini lesson in here for us that we get into a lot of trouble when we're overconfident about something that is outside of our control. And so this here, again, the uh, steward, uh, thankfully, under, again, under Joseph's direction, corrects that and says, no, we're not going to do that. In fact, we'll, we'll just take the one who stole it as a slave, and, and that'll be just fine. So <clears throat> with that, they go through the, uh, the, the bags, the sacks, and of course, Benjamin is busted. Now, we have to note here that, that this is a shock to everybody, no one more so than Benjamin. And this has to be a rough moment for everybody because everyone else is now going to doubt whether Benjamin really did steal it and try to hide it or squirrel it away. Everyone's going to doubt Benjamin's character in this whole affair. And that is going to add a another layer to this test because Joseph had done very little wrong when they turned on him. The only thing we could kind of pinpoint is being a little arrogant and a little boastful over his brothers, which is no by no means a good thing, but certainly not something that you would imagine would be punished by death or by being sold into slavery. Well, Benjamin here at least looks like he's caught red-handed doing something terribly foolish, incredibly selfish, and uh, that will ruin everything in terms of the Egypt's relationship to the family. So there's every reason here to say, look, Benjamin did it. I mean, he says he didn't, of course, we never saw, but it's in his, look, we can't argue with the facts of it. So Benjamin is, is certainly busted. Um, and that is going to play into the temptation for the, the sons of Israel. But we want to note just a, a brief aside as Joseph practice divination. There's two intimations here that this cup is used for divination and that, that perhaps Joseph does. Well, we would note that at this point in biblical history, before the giving of the law, there would be very little intimation that practicing divination was wrong or sinful. And so it might have been difficult for Joseph to distinguish between the righteous and godly interpretation of dreams and some other practice of, of foretelling the future. I mean, when you think about it, there's a lot of kind of divination that we practice today. What do we do? We look at the scientific facts and try to predict what the weather is going to be. We look at the, the various economic facts and we try to predict and find out what good markers for the economy will be. We look at all the facts and we try to predict what's going to happen politically in polls and forecasts. So again, I, I just want to note this because the world of magic and the, in the in magic and divination, all these things were not we're probably closer to how we view the sciences today in their mindset. So it is possible that prior to this time when God specifically disallowed uh, some kind of practices of divination, that Joseph might have thought that that was reasonably okay. I think it's, high, it's way more likely, however, and well, sorry, the reason why I want to point that out is that it's important that we understand that the Bible only holds people accountable for the amount of revelation that they have had at that point in the Bible. So we don't expect Abraham to know what Moses knows. We don't expect Moses to know what Isaiah knows. We, and on and on and on going forth into the, into the future. That's a big, important interpretive principle. So that's valuable to note. But that being said, I do believe that Joseph and his background and his relationship with the living God knew that it wasn't for him to dig after God's uh, pre, uh, revelation, that God would let him know if he wanted to let us know when we're, if he wants us to know something about the future. So it seems more likely that he's giving them a reason to continually believe that he is a, uh, a, a true Egyptian official and not related to them, kind of making sure that they don't suspect anything, giving them reason to believe that he would know so much about them and explaining that to them. Um, and 
again, just kind of continue the ruse. So that's where, I'll be honest with you, I think you could go either way, but that's where my uh, interpretation, my viewpoint of Joseph's character is, that he was just doing this to make it a more complete uh, ruse. So hopefully that's of, of some help as we understand this. this is, we often find it very troubling when the biblical heroes and characters are caught doing something that is less than uh, godly and less than perfect. But we would again remind us that if you walked out of this study of Genesis thinking there were any good people, you have not been paying attention. You've been sleeping way too much in this study. Every single quote unquote hero of the Old Testament is an absolute and utter failure before the Lord. Because the Bible doesn't give us a picture of a bunch of human heroes. It gives us a picture of a humanity incredible need, of an incredible need, in need of God's saving grace and powerful hand and arm of love. So it shouldn't trouble us if Joseph is goofing up, failing, and doing something, even that he knows is wrong, and if he were practicing divination. But I'll again say, with the character of Joseph, I, I don't suspect him of that. So, for Judah, however, this was a chance to finally make things right. You see, Judah had promised his father, and we saw in our previous study, that Reuben first stood up and said, well, I'll, I'll take him and you can kill my two sons if it goes wrong. And it kind of didn't get taken seriously. It seems like Reuben's that kind of guy, the kind of guy who's willing to do things, but just not do it right, not really be trustworthy, not really be your follow-through guy. But when Judah stands up and says, I'll take him, I'll take responsibility, finally Joseph relents. Granted, the situation had changed by that point. But now we see Judah, who seems to be particularly convicted by his past failures some 20 years before. And I wonder if he said, this is a chance. This is my chance to step in and make it right. Remember, it was Judah that stepped in and said, no, no, don't kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. Undoubtedly, being terrified of Simeon and Levi, who seemed like they'd kill anybody at the drop of a hat for any reason whatsoever. They're like, okay, well, 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 come on, guys. Let's just, let's see if we can make some money on this gig, right? It's Judah that stepped up and did that. And here's Judah finally getting to step up and actually sacrifice himself and say what he should have said back then. I don't care if you kill me or not. You're not taking my brother. My commitment to him is over and above my commitment to my own safety and selfish good. So then Judah tells the story. This is where we get to verse 18. And I want you to feel all the passion and all the drama and all the power of Judah telling this story. I can't believe that this story was told in monotone. I think that this, pa this passionate plea was filled with tears. And every moment he heard and saw the potential heartbreak and loss to his father once before because of his failures and his shortcomings. And now the potential of losing one again because of any reason he's willing to step up and take responsibility. So verse 18 says, Then Judah came near to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead and he alone is left of his mother's children and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, and we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother is with us. Then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity falls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Let's pause there for a moment. He takes the time 
to take Joseph, this, this, un, uh, this unknown Egyptian official, and, and express the absolute love, the, 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 the life that he would be crushing by taking Benjamin away. He shares all of the emotive value behind his love for his father and his father's love for Benjamin. He describes the amount of loss that they've already endured. He makes this huge, pathetic appeal. And that doesn't mean that he's pathetic. It means an emotional appeal. He makes a huge emotional appeal for this to happen. And it's a beautiful one at that. And we want to note that while our faith in the facts of God's word is not to override or be dictated by our emotions, our emotional reality and uh, the honesty of our love and connections, these pathetic connections that we have to each other, cannot be ignored in their value. And they cannot be ignored in our judgment and our, our, our assessment of life. Then he moves on and he says, Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the life's lad, it will happen that when he sees the lad is not with us, that he will die. Your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest I perhaps see the evil that would come upon my father? See, I love that Judah doesn't spend a half a moment trying to argue his innocence. He doesn't spend half a moment trying to argue with the fact that there is guilt somewhere in this picture. It's not even worth it. He moves immediately to his desire to give up anything and everything to see his brother Benjamin preserved here. He doesn't make even an allegation that they might be framed. He doesn't even suggest that there might be a misunderstanding. He says, it doesn't, it doesn't matter now. I see that that's closed. What's important to me, centrally and foremost, over and above all else, even seeing my family again, is my commitment to my love for my father, and my opportunity to see him reunited with his beloved son, Benjamin, as I promised, his word is on the line. This is a wonderful and rare picture in humanity of a person sacrificing himself for the better good or the help of another. Judah has grown. Judah has learned a truly selfless and godly type of love. And in this way, this subtle moment Judah gets to be a picture of the coming Messiah. We look at the gospel, it's so well and easily described in John 3.16, that God so loved the world. We were convicted. We were guilty. We are guilty and hopeless. And there was no opportunity that Jesus could make some sort of argument that we really weren't that bad. But because of the love of God as that undying motivation that desires the best for the loved one, regardless of the cost, he gave his only begotten son up. He gave up his life to pay for our sin. That whosoever might respond in faith, whoever believes and trusts in that permanent, eternal, perfect sacrifice for sin, that we might be permanently returned and restored to that everlasting life relationship, not perishing, but being restored to relationship with God forevermore. These most beautiful pictures in the Old Testament only serve as shadows and illusions of the immense and immeasurable love that God has for you. They're touching pictures as Judah's uh, offer and self-sacrifice is here. And we might think, I don't know that anyone's ever loved me that much in terms of the people surrounding me. But even if that is the case, and it's probably not, the God of the universe has loved you in this way. The God of the universe 
has loved you in this way. And that, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, forms the very background of everything in your life and every moment that you spend. The God of the universe loved you so much that he gave his son that you might be forgiven, not perish, and have everlasting life. As we move into chapter 45, we see that Joseph understandably loses it. It says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So he's going to send everybody out of the room. And when he says everybody, he's specifically talking about all his attendants, all of his officials, everybody from the, uh, the Egyptian group, which is a fascinating move anyway, because now he's thoroughly outnumbered by these brothers who are in jeopardy. If they wanted to at least even just get even with him, he's making himself vulnerable to them. And with Simeon and Levi in the room, who knows what could happen? And yet, I'm going to have to face Simeon and Levi after this life. And they'll be like, we heard you had some things to say about us. Like, okay, Guido, calm down. Okay, so anyway, Joseph cannot hold it together. He loses it in front of them, but he wants to make sure that this is in, intimate as possible. He sends everybody out and comes clean before them. I just want you to imagine this moment for them. They thought their brother was, they thought their brother was dead and gone, forever lost to them. There was no hope. And now all of a sudden this major paradigm shift and, and shift in their view of reality, that thing that they thought they could never be forgiven of, they could never forget, they could never make better. All of a sudden God is shown, showing them that all of their perception and expectation of what they thought was reality is now wrong. And it gives us at least a little bit of a moment for pause to say we are all tiny, little, silly things that have very limited perspectives at all times. And I believe it causes that we are behooved in Scripture to constantly live within the humility that we don't know all things, we don't see all things, and there may be a situation or a circumstance in your life that turns everything dramatically over on its head to help us remember our absolute reliance on God whose reality is not ever in jeopardy of being uh, turned upside down. But God uses this to turn their their whole world upside down. And we want to note here Joseph's perspective. It says, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were display, uh, dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So he came, they came near, near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. This verse shows us something. Up till now, we might have had to wonder and say that to some degree it would be justified. Has Joseph been putting this through this for revenge? Has Joseph been doing this to try to get even? I would. Isn't it possible that he would? What we find in this passage is that he had already forgiven them. I believe he had forgiven them before he ever set eye on them. He chose whatever point, at some point prior to this, to live in forgiveness and no longer hold that against them. So what is it that he's doing? What is it that he's doing here? What he's showing us that forgiveness doesn't mean exposing yourself to repeated abuses of another. You can forgive someone and say, yeah, but we're keeping that wall, that wall of separation. He'd already forgiven them. He no longer harbored this bitterness and hatred. And how is that possible? It's possible because he had a godly perspective. He said, yeah, it was our petty arguments. Maybe I had my part. You certainly failed me. And oh, it was terrible and awful. But you know what? We were all just part of God's bigger plan. And God wanted me to go through this to save lives. Can you look at your uh, trials in that same light. The next thing we see is that prophecy is meant to maintain actions. 
He says, for these two years of the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be no, neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a, pros, a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he had, has made a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down and do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall, not, uh, you shall be near to me, and your children and your children's children, and your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. Therefore, there I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, and there are th five, still five years of the famine. So, when God chooses to reveal something, it's because he expects us to respond to that. He expects us to react and live in light of that. So the first obvious reaction to uh, what God revealed to Pharaoh and explained through Joseph was that savings needed to be done. And, and he faithfully did that savings in the seven years of pros uh, prosperity. And now he responds again by saying, there's still five more years coming. Count on it. God told us. God revealed it. So come down here and change your manner of living. Change your placement of living. Come down and be a part of God's plan to uh, build up, save, and develop the nation of Israel so that they might come forth from Egypt full large, wealthy, and prepared to take the land which the Lord had prepared for him in his perfect time. The point is, is that prophecy is meant to motivate action. So when we talk about the coming of the Lord and the hopefully today rapture, his coming to snatch us up, we are meant to live in light of that reality. That is meant to motivate us, not just to the, the sense of that this could all be over and, and that'll be a great relief and oh, what a wonderful day it'll be to be face to face with the Lord. Yes, that's true. But it's also meant to give an eminence and a motiv motivation to us that this could be the last moment we have to share the gospel, to share the good news. This could be the last moment that we have at any chance, at any time, to share the truth that another person might miss the tribulation yet to come on this earth and the judgment of God on this earth. Understanding God's timeline for the earth helps us understand what we're meant to be doing. Are we meant to be building up better governments, doing better social works programs, getting things? Well, those might all be good things to do, but that's not our primary calling in life as Christians. Our primary calling in life as Christians is to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, his forgiveness, his hope, his love, so that when he makes this new or world anew, more and more people will be equipped to live in it. You see here a tearful reunion. Finally, of course, everybody is crying. He says, behold, your eyes and the eyes of your brother Benjamin see that it is my, uh, his, my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have been seen. And you shall hurry and bring my father here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brother talked, uh, brothers talked with him. I want you to think for a minute of all that Joseph's brothers had done. All the betrayal, all the hurt, the years of slavery. Think about how even when he was falsely uh, accused by Potiphar's wife and imprisoned, it was all his brother's fault from a human perspective. Would you ever let that go? Well, let me ask you a question. Remember the last time you got caught in uh, cut off in traffic? How long did it take you to let that go? That wasn't even really a, that much of an offense. We struggle. Okay, well, yours was different, though. Like, you almost died. That, you can hang on to that for, I'll give you two weeks. It's hard enough for us to forgive and move past even the most mild and petty offenses. And so when we've experienced, and many, if not all of us have, truly great betrayals, hurts, uh, wounds in life, especially from those who were supposed to love us and upon whom we were supposed to be able to trust it's so difficult, and it winds up being an emotional process that happens over years. And I think what this scene gives us is a picture of what had to have been going on with Joseph since very early on. 
He abandoned his right for, or his desire for retribution and started to forgive his brothers, I would guess, right away. Because when we hang on to bitterness and we hang on to and cling to that hatred, it eats us alive to the point where we can't even pretend to be happy to see. But what we see here is a genuine explosion of his love. When he thinks of the suffering it caused him and could point back to nine humans who are now in his power, but he weeps with joy. Genuine emotional overflow for the joyfulness of their uh, reunification. It shows that a miracle had been done in, jo in Joseph's heart. That he had chosen to respond in humility, love, and forgiveness for what had been done wrong to him. And the true beneficiary here was him. If he'd chosen to live in bitterness and anger towards his brothers and spent every day carrying that betrayal around, cycling through what he would do if he got up to them or what he would say if it was all happening again, continually reliving and redying that death, then he himself could not have become the man that God had intended him to be. His brothers, on the other hand, have seen every situation and, and encountered every part of this with guilty Consciences and suspicious eyes saying it's because of what we did that the Lord brought this. Every terror in their life has to be met with and every joy in their life is met with suspicion and fear because they're plagued by the guilt of what they've done. They need forgiveness. And Joseph chose to live in that forgiveness even before he could receive their apology. And in fact, we still see there's no apologies issued. I'm sure they were. I'm sure there were discussions. But what we see here is that Joseph already chose to live in that true forgiveness and the freedom that that true forgiveness provides. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Are you ready? To embrace that attitude of forgiveness. It can only be done by my accounting. If we understand and trust. In how complete and perfect Christ's forgiveness of us is. If we understand what we have been forgiven. In offending and transgressing against the almighty perfect righteous God of the universe. Then we will understand that any betrayal. Any hurt. Any failure uh, on a part of another that negatively affected us is at most, small beans. It's a small issue next to what we've been forgiven. And when we live this way, we receive the added bonus of actually being to live, able to live a life free from all the bitterness and the hatred and the clamor that clings to and crushes our souls and keeps us up nights as we stew on our beds and keeps us from creating new relationships because they're never going to be hurt like that again. We see here this wonderful balance between Joseph's absolute forgiveness, but also his unwillingness to entrust himself or endanger himself to these brothers until he's confident that they've grown. But then add to that the great joy that he gives hope that they will grow or could grow. And so they get all the good things here. Pharaoh hears about this. And, and, and decides that he's going to provide for Israel and uh, give Pharaoh's favor to them so that they can set up in the land and they can find a good situation that they can be cared for and grow safely into the nation that they're meant to be so that God's ultimate plan of bringing judgment on the unrighteousness of the Amorites and the Canaanites would finally happen, but in his time. So that, and I believe that's very strongly because there were people yet to be saved in those coming generations until the Lord would finally uh, pull the plug and send Israel back. And this final emotional moment where they get to tell Jacob. Can you think of what this would be like for this man who years ago had lost his beloved son the son with whom he'd spent the most time, the son with whom he, in whom he had invested the most, the son in whom all of his hopes were bound up, had been stolen from him. And now, 
and getting him back, back from the dead, if you will. Can you imagine the, the joy? In fact, did he dare to believe when his, when his son said, Joseph is still alive, and he's governor over all the land of Egypt. It says, and Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. When he told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry them, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive, and I will go and see him before I die. Life might offer us only a precious few of reunions like this, of this magnitude. But once we go home to be with the Lord, these reunions will be the order of the day. There's not one saint, not one brother or sister lost from you that you'll never see again. There's not one brother or sister in the Lord not one wife or husband, brother, child. You won't hold in your hands again if you're connected in Christ, if, if you're saved. That's a hope to which we can look forward to. That's why Paul would write in Thessalonians that we do not mourn as those who have no hope. We mourn, of course. If you're connected, if you've trusted in Christ, and if the ones you've lost were your family and him, they've trusted in Christ. There are no permanent goodbyes in the body of Christ. So a couple of closing applications for you. One, believe people can change and grow. First Corinthians 13 tells us that love hopes all things and believes all things. It doesn't mean that love is naive or stupid. And it certainly doesn't mean that love trusts in human nature, human's ability to grow or get better. It trusts in God's ability to change shape and form hearts. And the reason why you should trust that God can change and reform another, you ever get to that point where you say, oh, well, that, that person, they'll never change. He'll never apologize. They'll never give up. They'll never forgive, whatever it is, right? You realize that hopelessness, you're self-condemning. I mean... Don't we live every day in the hope and trust that Jesus Christ can change my heart? And it is a simple, logical connection that if we trust Christ to change our heart, that he can also change and work in the lives of another. Say, uh, Saul, who radically and completely rejects Christ and everything about him, going about trying to kill Christians, God says, you're going to be my special mouthpiece. Joseph here shows a cautious, a responsible faith in people's ability to grow and change. Next, might I challenge you to live in radical forgiveness. If you're going to take, if you're the type that takes a homework assignment, pay attention every time that ugly feeling comes up in you that is still angry at so-and-so about something and forgive them. It still holds on to that time that you were betrayed, that time that you were hurt, that, that time that you lost. And even though, please recognize that the loss and the betrayal was real, it was authentic, that your feelings are not unreasonable or stupid or ridiculous. They're exactly right and in keep, right keeping with reality. But Christ gives us a, an ability to heal beyond our natural limitations. But as the gentleman that he is, he won't force you to do it. He offers you the ability to walk in that radical forgiveness and he waits upon you to make the choice to do so. Finally, seeing things from the divine perspective. Not finally, rather. Seeing things from the divine perspective. Are you ready to begin to view your life, your challenges, your trials, your joys, your direction, your confusion, your absolute loss, at being at a loss for where you're going or what the Lord's doing here? the mundaneness of the days, or the excitement and the stress? Are you willing to look at each of those as something which the Lord God Almighty is using to shape you into the man or woman of God that he desires to glorify himself and utilize in his world? 
Are you ready to look at your life from the divine perspective and know that while everything feels like it's completely out of your control, that it is not out of sight of the control of the one who loves you and is able to work all things together for your good and your ultimate conformity to the image of Christ? Are you ready to see things from the divine perspective and realize that God's goal for your life is not that you get all the stuff or have all the things or are happy all the time or are healthy all the time. God's goal for your life is that you would be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ both now and forevermore. Amen. An eternal artwork that exists, lives, breathes, walks, and talks to his glory. Are you ready to embrace his goals for your life and let go of all the things that we put in our life to try to make ourselves feel happy or distract us for a moment? Might we live in the light of the truth this week? Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you for your wonderful word. We thank you for the lives of these saints, of Joseph and his radical forgiveness. We know that that was possible because of your working in his life. Oh, Lord God, please be glorified in us each and every day. Let us grow in the grace and knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, and trust in your perfect plan for us, walking in faith, day by day, moment by moment. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.